Democracy, philosophy, geometry, even Nike, their winged goddess of victory. We owe the ancient Greeks a lot. But what was it like to live in Athens, Thebes or Sparta, while the foundations of Western civilization were being laid before your eyes? Fifty years ago, an English novelist living in South Africa asked herself that question. Neither a classicist nor historian, Mary Reno's answers were so persuasive that she literally transformed the relationship between our modern world and ancient Greece. i tell you how it started. I think Greece had been brewing in my mind for a long time. They had a rather good library at my school because I think somebody had given them a whole lot of books, which we weren't actually taught at all. They were just sort of sitting there. And when you got more senior, you could riffle about in this library. And I found Plato's dialogues and I was entranced with them. But I thought, what was it like to be among all these people? What was it actually like? What were these people actually like? And all this so fascinated me, I wanted to put it all together into a book. And that's how I started to write about Greece. Oh, I loved her books. We all enjoyed them as a family. I thought they were absolutely terrific. I was terribly moved by them. The Last of the Wine and The Bull from the Sea. I remember reading this book, The King Must Die, and immediately becoming entranced and obsessed with it. She had got this amazing imagination for scenery, sort of intuition, almost supernatural. She was probably a tough old dame, and at the same time, she was extremely speculative herself and romantic. She creates a Greece that's rich in texture, incident, and detail that you can imagine living in. It seemed lit with what I imagined was an energy and glow. In all, between 1956 and 1981, Mary Reno was to write eight novels set in ancient Greece. Two were about the legendary Theseus, he of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth. The other six spanned the 200 critical years of Greek and Macedonian history, from the Persian Wars to the trilogy on the life and death of Alexander the Great. Through them all, the great names of Greek history walked again. I think it's partly because she is a brilliant writer. I mean, there is no doubt about it. She starts her books so fantastically well. This is um, The Bull from the Sea, so this is one of the first ones that I ever read. And this is just the, the opening couple of sentences. It was dolphin weather when I sailed into Piraeus with my comrades of the Cretan bull ring. Knossos had fallen, which time out of mind had ruled the seas. The smoke of the burning labyrinth still clung to our clothes and hair. So, fantastic, immediately you're into the story and you know it's going to be a true adventure tale. It's the sensuality, it's the taste, the smell, the texture. The, you can taste the wine, you can see the food, you can go with her through the mountains and you feel that the mountains are real. I have never seen a Greek mountain, but I know how it feels, or I think I know how it feels, and that's the key. Having read Fire From Heaven, I then read every single Mary Reno novel in a sort of blaze of enthusiasm. But the one that really sticks in my mind is the sequel, um, The Persian Boy. I think um, partly because up until that point, I had always identified with the Greeks. It had never really crossed my mind that you could identify with the Persians, that you could see Greek culture through Persian eyes. And so that was a, a great revelation. But principally, I remember it. <laughs> my, I remember it for the castration scene, because I had never, again, this was something I had never appreciated, that somebody could actually be castrated. And from that point on, I never, I never sort of regarded my testicles in quite the same way. Her first Greek novel, The Last of the Wine, set the tone for what was to follow. Cast in the form of a memoir, it mixes the fictional coming of age of a young Athenian called Alexius with the real events of the terrible war with Sparta, which marked the collapse of the golden age of Athens. Its teeming cast included many historical figures, not least Socrates. 
you can't hold a reader unless you involve them in characters. And she could create not only fictional characters, which she did, but she made those historical people so real. Socrates in The Last of the Wine is, in fact, so lovable. Uh, and you feel uh, that you're almost sitting there listening to him. I studied classical studies while I was studying film at NYU, and it was the most exciting side study because our teacher was fabulous, and he was, had the ability to, as great teachers do, to take leaps of imagination, flights of, into mythology, which, is, which a lot of this is, and bring us the class with him. Renault, uh, Mary Renault did the same thing for me as a young man. After you read uh, Bull from the Sea and The King Must Die, you know, in some ways, you wanted to be Theseus, you know, you, you, he was a great hero. It was Alexander, it was the person of Alexander. And in Alexander, I found a man who was everything that I wanted in a hero. He was great, and yet he was human, and he had an emotional life I could respond to, which I'm not sure why, because he was... 2,000 years ago, he was Greek, he was male in a culture that was so misogynist. Um, but he was inspiring. Many historical novelists will choose to focus on you know, the, the ordinary man, the ordinary woman who stands outside um, the course of events. Mary Renault absolutely goes to the opposite extreme. Alexander and Plato, I mean, you couldn't have bigger protagonists, really. Plato went back to the letter. Once, while I was looking out of the window as I drank and thinking my own thoughts, I felt him looking at me and turned. I had been prepared, I suppose, because it was important business to find him making sure of me, weighing me up. But he was thinking, thinking through me, you might say. He looked away from courtesy, but for a moment I had felt him, as it seemed, going right through to whatever appeared to him the causes of my being, as if I were a cube or a star. It was Renault's timing that was remarkable. When The Last of the Wine appeared in 1956, professional classicists, the self-appointed gatekeepers to the ancient world, had already been huddling together in the older universities for years, wondering how their once all-conquering discipline had become a schoolboy joke. They are still there. Classics has a very long history, and it's a history that it was complacent about for far too long of being the humanities discipline. If you go to Oxford, you'll find that the classics degree there is still called literae humaniores, literally humanity, back from when it was the only subject you could study that wasn't divinity. 19th century classics was very much a preparation for empire. Young men were being schooled in Latin Greek and then sent out to administer the world. In the public schools in England uh, up until the Great War, something like 50% of all your class time was spent studying Latin and Greek. Um, what you studied was the Latin and Greek languages, and the literature was deeply contested as it tried to fight its way into the university curricula, even more so archaeology. The limits of a classical education are becoming ever more apparent. You can no longer have a government cabinet in which no one understands how machines work or what electricity is. It, there's only a certain uh, limit to how useful it is to quote Demosthenes. It was never about classical culture. It was never about introducing students to a whole other world of experiences and perspectives. It was always about the grammar in a grinding way. But clearly the man is doing what he doesn't want to do, and therefore his action is not free. Well, now, wait a moment. I'm not quite sure that you've got Aristotle's meaning. Let's have a look at the text, shall we? There's a great paradox about the 1950s. Um, in many ways, it was one of the most revolutionary and thrilling times for the subject. It was a period when, for example, the linear B script was deciphered, and finally we had unexpected access to the actual words of Mycenaean Greeks, the Greeks of the Age of Heroes. And uh, suddenly they became accessible to us in ways that they hadn't been before. And yet, of course, this was perhaps the time of greatest trench warfare over the classical languages in schools. 
You can see the tide turnings in Rattigan's play and then film the Browning version, which centers on this rather uh, withered and has-been figure. Michael Redgrave won awards for his portrayal of the classics teacher who preferred his Greek more dead than alive. After all, she did kill her husband. She's just been revealed with his dead body weltering in gore. I am delighted at this evidence, Taplow, of your interest in the rather more lurid aspects of dramaturgy, but I feel I must remind you that you are supposed to be construing Greek, not collaborating with Aeschylus. But there were other films. Prompted by the invention of cinemascope and the new threat of television, Hollywood in the 1950s was in one of its periodic spasms of enthusiasm for swords and sandals. And there were other books. Robert Graves' I. Claudius novels before the war. Rosemary Sutcliffe and Margaret Usena after it. They all had one thing in common which Renault did not share. Popular recreations of the classical world tend to focus on Rome because Rome did spectacle and entertainment very well. I think Greece is altogether harder and I think it's noticeable that, that recent Hollywood films, Troy, Alexander, that have had a Greek setting have tended to flop in comparison to Gladiator, obviously. I loved Alexander from the moment I read about him in Fire from Heaven as a boy. Because what boy wouldn't be stimulated to, to noble exploits by, not, by reading Alexander? The king now! The king! Stone's epic film drew many of the same conclusions about Alexander that Reno had. When I did the movie, I certainly, you know, read A Persian Boy over again and Parts of Fire from Heaven, and she caught a feeling, a mood. I think the Greeks have more grace in their storytelling, and the, I like the armor better. The Romans are uh, kind of heavy duty, uh, a little bit fascist. Uh, uh, I admire their strength, but they're like. I see a more didactic, prosaic approach. I would say the Romans were the Americans, uh, and the Greeks were the, uh, if you want, the British. It's almost as though Rome and Greece are two separate hemispheres of the Western brain, that Rome is about practicality and duty and loyalty to the state and the furthering of empire, and Greece is about the life of the mind and the life of the soul. Greece is about spirituality and, above all, an appreciation of beauty. Greece is aesthetics. There were plenty of clues to what ancient Greece had been like, but it needed the tenacity of a detective and the imagination of a novelist to stitch them together. Few classicists had either, and the occasional archaeologist who had tried lacked Reno's uncanny empathy. With the Theseus stories in Minoan Crete, there was even less to go on than in the Athens of Pericles and the Parthenon. But her educated guesswork has often been borne out by more recent archaeology. She gave a taste of her methods in the only British television interview she ever gave, at her home in Cape Town in 1981. And, of course, the artwork, too, is tremendously important. If you look at a collection of Greek vases, which you can have in a book, of course, as well as in a museum, you find all kinds of daily things that they use, things you wouldn't know about, things you won't read about in a book. Now, the research into those Greek novels, the research is tremendous, but she studied, first of all, she studied the vases, studied all those depictions. She picked up so much from those. She just looked at a vase and she was able to see how people stood, she was able to see the small details of the ornaments that they had, of the furniture that they had, of the way that they used the furniture, and she was able to build that in, in ways that then those who knew a little bit about classics were able to say, yes, that's true. And that again, that's that, it's that, yes, that bit is true, therefore the whole fiction must be true, that makes it real, that grounds it, that makes it feel as if you really were there. And that's her skill. It combines the richness of detail that we're seeing in the Roman toga dramas of the time in Hollywood's new for old ancient Rome with a vibrant narrative that's full of culturally authentic detail. In other words, she's not just doing archaeology as props, 
as so many of the Roman dramas are. Quo Vadis, for instance, lots of the detail looks kind of persuasive if you don't look too closely. She's also doing cultural attitudes. Often images did speak louder than words, so the visual impact of the world around you was very important, um, as was the various sensory impacts. Um, so if you travelled to a city like, like Troy in 1300 BC, for instance, what you'd have noticed first of all would have been the extraordinary um, cacophony of sounds of different voices of people from all over the eastern Mediterranean and also this absolute melange of smells as various boats unlo unloaded their wares. So that is something that she got absolutely right about the ancient world. Xenophon and I, to escape all this gloom in the city, spent our spare time at Piraeus. Here, there was always something new. A rich metic from Phrygia or Egypt might be building himself a house in the style of his former city, or putting up a shrine to one of the gods whom one hardly knew in his foreign dress, with even a dog's head, perhaps, or a fish's tail. Or there would be a new shipment in the Emporion of carpets from Babylon, Persian lapis, Scythian turquoises, or tin and amber from the wild Hyperborean places that only the Phoenicians know. You saw in the wide streets Nubians with plugs of ivory pulling their ears down to their shoulders, long-haired Medes in trousers and sequin bonnets, Egyptians with painted eyes wearing only skirts of stiff linen and collars of gems and beads. The air was heavy with smells of foreign bodies, of spices and hemp and pitch. Strange tongues chattered like beasts speaking to bird. One